Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this third Q&A session of a four-part series on the TSI revision package. I'm Cyril Martin, Communication Officer, and I'm honored to be your moderator. As you know, the TSI revision package 2023 has come into effect on the 28th of September 2023. To give you the opportunity to ask as many questions as possible, we have decided to organize four Q&A sessions, each focused on a specific theme. Today, we will focus on fixed installations. The fourth and last session dedicated to CCS will take place on the 7th of December. We have provided you with the option to send us your questions in advance. And of course, the chat is open to you throughout the duration of the sessions. We will do our best to address questions asked during the live session as well, but priority will be given to the questions received in advance. Last but not least, we kindly request that you limit your questions to the specific themes and topics covered in each of these sessions. To discuss today's topics, I'm pleased to welcome Roberto Mele, Project Officer within the Safety and Operations Unit at ERA, and Gaetano Imperato, Esteban Coito Gonzalez, and Antoine de Fosse, all being Project Officers within the Rolling Stock and Fixed Installations Unit at ERA. Today, unfortunately, my colleague Joao Gaspar couldn't be here, so I will have the pleasure to relay your questions to our speakers. A last word to say that, as we do every time, this Q&A session is being recorded and will be made available on our website and in our social media channels later today. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to Roberto Mele for the first part of this Q&A session. Please, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good uh, afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. It's uh, two minutes past uh, 12. So good afternoon, everybody. So I have prepared a quick presentation on an error clarification note that has been published a couple of weeks ago uh, on uh, our ERA website uh, discussing the topic of competence and emergency management. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, as was mentioned by Cyril at the beginning of the of the meeting, uh, the TSIOP amendments have been published in uh, September this year uh, with the Commission Regulation 2023-1693. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a sort of, uh, let's say, dates for implementation on where we are with the TSIOP. Uh, and so basically, as you can see, uh, TSIOP 2019 still have some effects on the dates for the implementation of the TSI into uh, the real uh, um, op operational uh, and traffic management uh, um, subsystem. Uh, I would say that here there are two main um, deadlines that are crucial for the member states and for the uh, railway undertakings and infrastructure managers and those are namely uh, the 28th of June 2024. It is the deadline for all railway undertakings and all infrastructure managers to adapt their SMS to the new regulation amending the TSIOP. And uh, the second one is the 28th of March next year. So 2024, it is the deadline for the member states to uh, develop uh, and publish their plan for uh, national safety rules cleaning up. So basically member states are called to adapt uh, um, the national legal framework to the amendments to the TSIOP as published by the new regulation. So uh, an error clarification note, as I was mentioned uh, before, has been published on the uh, on error website uh, with the intent, with the aim to clarify um, how to facilitate uh, the um, their definition and description in the SMS of the railway undertaking and infrastructure manager and make the process of cleaning up rules smooth and uh, consistent. Uh, here below you can see also the link on uh, on I mean the link to the ERA website where the clarification note has been uh, published. 
So um, going to the content of the competence management. So as you may see on the uh, blue square on the left of the slide, this is the new text and there is this uh, new word accepted that has been highlighted here in, uh, in red. Um, here it's necessary to clarify that this exceptions uh, is not for the SMS competence management system process, but uh, the exception point mm -hmm. Uh, points to harmonize the requirements as set out in the train driver directives and uh, into the appendix F and G of the TSIOP. And so the, uh, these harmonized requirements shall apply and shall not be subject to description and definition by each RU and uh, uh, IM. So uh, member states are not allowed to set any national rules on uh, any additional requirements to those that have been already harmonized in the EU legislation. Uh, national rules on competence requirements shall not exceed, uh, exist except for, uh, um, except when permitted by the TSIOP Appendix I. Uh, then, uh, uh, indeed, uh, on the left side here, you can see the new text of the new Appendix I containing uh, the list of open points. One is the point F, that is on professional competence, and it states uh, evidence of professional competence. Uh, this, uh, um, uh, this open point uh, refer exclusively to the document for the professional competence that shall be given to the staff uh, and only the format of the evidence or documentation can be considered as the national rules. Um, and then again on uh, Appendix I where the list of open points is contained. There is another point relating with uh, professional competences that is element relevant to professional qualification for the task associated with dispatching trains and authorizing train movement. Here in the clarification note, it is made clear that uh, dispatching trains and authorizing train movement is an exclusive task of the infrastructure manager. Therefore, any national rules defining uh, uh, competence elements relevant to professional qualification for RU staff uh, is not permitted. Um, then, uh, uh, once again, here on the left side, you can see the new text. Uh, it has been uh, it, it has been clarified that within the SMS of every railway undertaking and infrastructure manager um, shall be uh, identify what the safety critical tasks and safety related functions are. Um, and so, uh, in the clarification note, it has been clarified that the harmonized safety critical tasks referring to the TSIOP are those covered by the train driver directive and the appendixes F and G. And, uh, and um, the tasks carried out by the IM are subject to, uh, to national rules. Other safety critical tasks, which are not covered by the TSIOP and the train driver directive, shall define and describe into the SMS. Uh, for example, tire workers, uh, staff uh, operating in a martial yard, etc., etc. Uh, there are also staff which can have safety related functions, such as, um, for instance, uh, train and timetable planners, train driver managers, safety managers. Uh, both safety critical tasks and safety related function must be covered by the SMS. So there cannot be any national rule on issues such as the identification of staff, selection principles, and so on and so on. Um, then uh, there has been, the, uh, the, there is also an amendment to 0.4.7. Uh, of the TSIOP and basically here we clarify that the SMS of the RU and the IM shall set up and document the process they put in place on medical requirements uh, and uh, a train driver directive and TSIOP 4.7 set those medical requirements for, for some staff. For all other staff, uh, for example, staff having safety related functions, the RU and the IM should determine what is needed on a risk-based approach. National rules are only permitted for alcohol, 
drugs and psychotropic medication levels. Um, then we come to the topic of the emergency management. Uh, as you can see on the left side in the blue square there, in appendix I, there is another point relating with managing an emergency situation and emergency re response. In the clarification note, it has been clarified that this is only limited to aspect of communication with and information transfer to external entities mentioned, such as the National Investigation Body, the NSA and whatever. In parallel, the common safety method on SMS requirements contains all RUs and IMs obligation vis-a-vis -vis planning, execution, monitoring and reviewing of their SMS processes and instructions. In addition, training of all relevant staff to deal with emergency management shall also be part of the SMS. I think that was the last question, the last slide on uh, uh, the clarification notes. So that I will pass the floor back to Cyril and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Roberto. And without further ado, I will now directly give the floor to Gaetano Imperato. Uh, who has also prepared some slides to, re pre to reply to some of the questions that were sent. Please, Gaetano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, Roberto. So, um, as was mentioned, um, we have prepared some slides to answer some questions that we received, uh, in my case, for TSI Inf and TSI Energy. And uh, as you can see displayed, uh, we have tried to summarize some of these questions in a simple way. So first was, uh, will I need to move to the latest TSI in Fed Energy and how is uh, my project impacted? So if we go to the next slides. So first of all, uh, to address this question, um, I have underlined that there is no transition. I would like to underline that there is no transition regime for the INF and energy TSI and the application, as was mentioned also by Cyril, is since uh, 28 September 2023. Uh, no panic. We need uh, you need to really to understand uh, what what has changed. And in the chapter seven, we have um, make a distinction uh, about the new infrastructure and energy subsystem uh, and uh, upgrading subsystem. So where is the difference? In case of uh, new infrastructure subsystem, uh, we have uh, uh, a full application of ETSI. Uh, nothing has changed. So this is, uh, uh, if you have a project, uh, you don't need to be scared because uh, uh, no new requirement has been added uh, in the amendment uh, that uh, have, we have provided. So only clarification was made for TSI INF and TSI Energy. How I understand that is a new project. So we have in chapter 7.2 for a new infrastructure subsystem means an infrastructure subsystem placed into service after 28th of September, which creates a route or part of a route where none currently exists. So this is a, a definition that we have also before. And for energy part, we have another definition, means an energy subsystem placed into service after 28th of September, which create where no traction power supply and OCL previously existed. So this is the point for new infrastructure. In case, and this is the majority of case, uh, we see in the next slides what will happen in case you have an existing infrastructure. When you have an existing infrastructure, uh, you have also here two choices, mainly two choices. One if is an up, you need to answer the question, I am doing an upgrading. Uh, what does it mean uh, uh, upgrading? We try to, um, to identify in the chapter seven, uh, two, three, uh, three cases. So these cases are realignment of part of an existing route, a creation of bypass, and the third, uh, an addition of one of more track on existing route. These are uh, represent uh, clear cases of upgrading. 
we added uh, a performance criteria that can be used also to identify. And in the case of infrastructure, this uh, means uh, um, uh, is a upgrading is a major modification worth on existing infrastructure uh, subsystem, resulting at least compliance with one of additional uh, traffic code or a change in the declared combination of traffic codes. So for this, we have uh, updated the table two and three to to really have um, uh, give you a clear uh, understanding because in some cases you have not declared. So it's important that you declare this uh, uh, combination of traffic before you start uh, uh, this type of upgrading. Um, in these slides, uh, I have also uh, reminded that in case of upgrading, and this is a novelty, I have to say, we will have uh, uh, you have a full application of all basic parameters uh, uh, regarding the project. So it's important that you define the geographical coverage of the project because for this point, for this project, you, will, you, you need to fulfill all the basic parameters. Then we will see in the next slide we have also some exception to this case. You can move. Okay. So. Um, so the, the good news indeed is that there are exceptions. So it's just to start from the bottom of my slides. We have uh, can't, can deficiency, platform might and offset. So we are cases where we have uh, foreseen some uh, exception. Another point uh, important for the existing, uh, for the existing uh, infrastructure are uh, that you don't need to apply the requirements for new lines. This is a specific of the inf uh, TSI, not for the energy, but in the inf TSI, we are, sometimes we have specified, an example is, are the bridges, so you don't go to rebuild the bridges if you do an upgrading. So we have specific requirement for bridges in this case. Um, uh, what else? Uh, so um, the other cases that I was mentioning is, uh, is uh, at the bottom of our slides is over than an upgrading. So you have a project that follow under this case, so it's not an upgrading, but it's a major project. Uh, in this case, you can only, um, com you need, you have the obligation to comply only to the parameters that uh, uh, introduced by the change. The other parameters affected, so uh, in this case, you have a coverage, uh, you have identified the project, but you have not touched these parameters. In this case, you are not obliged to uh, fulfill the TSI requirement, but you can also, you can, anyway, you can uh, take this opportunity to demonstrate if it is the case. Um, I think with these slides, uh, we can move to the, uh, to the other subsystem, so. Indeed, as I was mentioning, uh, for new existing, the difference was, uh, was eerie in the definition of a, a, a of the new subsystem. In case of upgrading, we have uh, uh, also other four cases where you can understand uh, if your project fall in this situation. So in the 7.2, we have the similar three cases that uh, were mentioned for the infrastructure subsystem, plus the performance criteria that in this case is an increase of the speed of more than uh, 30 kilometers per hour. Also in this case of upgrading, you are obliged to fulfill all basic parameters. So it's really important this geographical coverage. We'll see, uh, I think I'm starting to see some questions, so we will uh, uh, detail after. Um, moving to the next slide. Yes, uh, so as also uh, the other cases, we have also uh, other, uh, over than an upgrading. So in this case, as mentioned before, only the change, the basic parameter affected by the change need to be put in compliance with the TSI. Uh, also in this case, we have for existing energy subsystem, we have an exception. So in this case is only one, so it's maximum lat lateral deviation of OCL. Uh, I think that I have, uh, this was my last slide, if I'm not wrong, so I think I will pass the floor to uh, Cyril uh, and Antoine. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> and I will directly pass the floor back now to Antoine de Fossé. Please, Antoine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cyril. 
good uh, good afternoon everyone so i will uh, i will make a presentation for uh, the application of the prm tsi for the part relative to fixed installations at the stations um, on the same uh, on the same type of questions that we have received about the, the existence of a transition period and we also received many questions about what is uh, to be deep what is to be included in the scope of an upgrade or renewal of a station and what needs to be assessed by a notified body. So I will try to present shortly some elements of the TSI on these aspects. I would like to move to the next slide or immediately, which is about the application of the PRM to SI to new stations. But we don't define new stations in the PRM TSI. Uh, which did not seem necessary to, to the member of the working party. We did not have a question about the definition of a new station. Uh, but nevertheless, it's clear that the PRM TSI applies to new stations since the 28th of September 2023. So since it entered into force, uh, it's fully applicable to all new stations that are in its scope. We keep the same um flexibility as in previous uh, versions saying that when there are projects at an advanced stage of development so when there are ongoing projects for station or when there are projects for which budget has been granted or for which are in the final phase of uh, of tendering then it is possible to continue at applying the previous version of the tsi it's not mandatory to apply this new one but since the TSI PRM exists now since 2008. We expect that uh, all projects for new station apply, if not the version 2014, at least the version 2008. So we can go to the next slide about uh, existing station. So for existing station, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit different, let's say, uh, compared to what is in infrastructure and energy TSI, uh, because we take into consideration the fact that we have a railway system that exists, uh, including uh, stations that were built for some of them 100 years ago or maybe more, at a time where accessibility was absolutely not a concern for the railway sector as a whole, let's say. Uh, so we have to take into consideration that, that fact, and so we promote a gradual improvement of accessibility. Uh, this gradual improvement, I will explain a little bit more in the following slide, but this gradual improvement is completed by three exceptions. When a route is created from uh, existing structures like existing stairways, existing uh, subway tunnels, existing uh, bridges, then the requirement related to, to the width of the obstacle-free route is not mandatory. Uh, similarly, the width of the platform is a requirement that is not mandatory for existing stations. In particular, if enlarging the platforms would result in heavy work, like removal of some, uh, some tracks, etc. So the width of the platform is not mandatory. And in some cases, stations are historic buildings uh, recognized as such and pro protected by, by national law. So in that case, there are specific requirements that would apply and the TSI is not mandatory also. So there are, there are three exceptions, plus this notion of gradual improvement of accessibility that uh, we'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. Voilà. So for improving the accessibility, there are two, two main uh, tools, let's say. The first one is the coordinated approach. This coordinated approach is described in the national implementation plans that were required by the TSI in 2015. So all the plans are available. They are published on the website of the Commission. I give you the link on this slide. And these implementation plans, they include a strategy, they include a prioritization rule to describe which stations will be covered in priority compared to other uh, stations, explaining according which criteria this prioritization rule has been uh, established. Generally, it's based on the number of passengers per day traveling through that station. 
There can also be other criteria like the existence of a specific um, uh, specific places for, for people with reduced mobility in the nearby, etc. So these plans they dis describe the strategies, the, the criteria for the prioritization, and they also describe the extent of the upgrade or renewal of stations that are included in the plan. So this, this plan is really a coordinated approach that is discussed between all actors in each member state, the governments, the associations, the railway sector, in order to, to, uh, to develop really um, voilà, a way to, to, to spend the money allocated for the improvement accessibility in a smart way. And there are also, of course, other upgrades and other renewal that are taking place independently of the national implementation plan. In that case, it's a case by case approach that is to be followed. So let's uh, see a bit more detail about priority national implementation plans. So here I just copied some example of uh, existing plans uh, that are available. <coughs> And you see, for example, in this particular member state, the prioritization rule for stations is built, is made on the basis of the daily passenger flow. That's what is done in most of the cases. Uh, the existence of in the station of a remote platform accessed by uh, by a footbridge or by a level crossing. And also uh, point C, uh, the case of stations with a large number of users with reduced mobility due to the presence of, uh, of an hospital or <coughs> equivalent uh, type of uh, institution around. So this is a prioritization rule. And the criteria for the stations that are processed in priority is to comply with the uh, current building uh, regulation applying to person with reduced mobility. So it's not to comply to the TSI, it's to comply to the national building regulation because the PRM TSI is also uh, a regulation that is applicable in parallel to many national regulations that exist in uh, all European uh, countries, I think now. And these uh, national regulations, they apply to all public access building stations, but also they can apply to uh, stations of public transport. They can apply to airport. They can apply to uh, public administration that is accessible to the public, museum, libraries, etc. So in the PRM TSI, we have to take care that we do not hinder the development of accessibility by being too strict in the application of detailed requirements that are specific to railway. That's why we have created this, um, this requirement to develop a national plan, and the national plan lists somehow the parameters to apply in case of a bread renewal. And I think on the next slide, you will see the case here in this national plan. Uh, for example, it is written that for stairs, there will be tactile warning surface utilized in accordance with the building regulation. Staircases will have dual unrails, will be uh, painted in, contra in contrasting color, sorry. And the step nose will be highlighted and contrasted in color for visual impaired customers. So these are the requirements applicable for the stairs. And you can see that in particular, the width of the stair which is a requirement of the PRM TSI to be of 160 centimeter minimum, it's not present. Meaning that according to this national implementation plan, the stations that will be processed for which in, in accessibility will be improved, there will be tactile uh, work, working surface indicators, there will be contrasting bands, there will be double and rate, but there will not be uh, improvement of the width as permitted also by the TSI. So that's the meaning of the gradual improvement of accessibility. That's really a good example. First, it does not cover all station areas. It's possible to, uh, to upgrade only part of a station 
in the first uh, during the first time and then another part of the station and it does not cover all TSI characteristics also. So we can move to the next slide. <coughs> so what is the role then of the notified body in this uh, type of upgrade? Because for a notified body, and this is an experience we get because we, we are also uh, uh, involved in discussion with notified body, it's sometimes difficult to close the eyes on uh, non-conformity when they see the non-conformity. So what is the role of the notified body, in particular with the new TSI? Because we have a change that is quite important in the PRM TSI, which is described on the next slide. Voilà. What has changed in the PRM TSI? So uh, this is a table taken from an appendix Annex E of the TSI PRM that describes the activities to be carried out by the notified body uh, for stations only, not for running stock. And you see that in the version of 2014, there, there was in the column about site inspection, a lot of X between brackets saying that it was possible to provide as built uh, drawing instead of doing a site inspection. Meaning that uh, in the version of 2014 of the TSI, the role of notified body on site was very limited. And then we realized that there were uh, still the need to have notified body visits on site because it's easy to make mistakes, misunderstanding in the TSI PRM. It seems to be quite easy because it's only a question of dimensions, a uh, question of uh, well, generally, elements are expressed in, in widths, eights. So it does not seem very complex, but in fact, it's not so easy than that. That's why in 2023, we have reintroduced the site inspection for most of the parameters of the TSI PRM. So it means that notified body will probably be more involved in site inspection, and it's important to clarify what is their task uh, when inspecting a station. Uh, so this is explained in the next slide. The scope of the notified body assessment should really be limited to the assessment of the parts of the stations that have been renewed or upgraded according either to the national implementation plan or for uh, other upgrade renewals that are coming in addition on the basis of the scope defined by the station manager. And for those parts that have been renewed and upgraded, only to the characteristics that have been renewed or upgraded. So it's important when placing the contract between the station manager and the notified body to really indicate what is the scope of the upgrade within the station and what are the characteristics that are upgraded within that scope. And to agree with the notified body, uh, that only those characteristics will be assessed during the uh, certification, during the assessment. Uh, thank you very much. I will now pass the floor to Esteban for the next uh, next topic. So, good morning, to the participants uh, in this uh, webinar. As you have seen before, uh, Gaetano uh, has introduced uh, several topics and elements uh, for the implementation on the TSI uh, in for the TSI energy, for which we both are in charge. Uh, in this point, uh, I have to remember that the implementation of both TSIs is harmonized, is quite uh, homogeneous among them, and uh, we will come back to some questions we already received in this phase at the end of this webinar in the question and clarification uh, phase. I have to say now that uh, on top of these questions on the TSI's implementation, we have received other uh, more technical uh, questions on the, um, on the TSI's. So uh, we have selected uh, for today uh, four topics uh, to try to answer all these, uh, these questions. Uh, the first one, is uh, the one you see in the slide, the uh, evolution of the NTSI uh, in order to facilitate the charging of uh, traction uh, batteries. Next slide, please. 
for this topic, uh, the ERA and the members of the topical uh, working group uh, uh, have developed an important work to improve the TSI in order to facilitate the use of battery trains, because at the end, the, the objective is to enable, you know, the, the green potential of the rail transport. I have to explain to you that in order to understand the problem, uh, in the section four to five, the current at the standstill still in the NATSI is referring to the standard 5367, which limits the maximum current at the standstill still for vehicles. The stand still, okay, most of you probably uh, already know, is the situation when the train is stopped, not in movement, uh, with the pantograph or where uh, the, pantograph, the pantograph could be rise and in contact with the OCL. The requirement is also corresponding to the section 42825 of the Lock and Pass uh, TSI. You see in the slide uh, the requirement that is in the TSI, TSI uh, Lock and Pass. Um, the OCL shall be designed to sustain at least the values of current at a standard steel per pantograph in accordance with the specifications referred in the appendix index 2, which is the limits in the standard 5367. The purpose of this requirement is logically the, the, the safety, is to avoid the, the overheating of the OCL contact wear and the pantograph. However, it has a negative impact in the charging capacity of battery trains, uh, increasing the time needed for charging the, the batteries. Next slide, please. So in order to solve it, uh, the experts and, uh, in ERA, um, um, we discussed and uh, what, how to explain that, um, you know, the current limit at the stand still is now uh, updated in the reference of the standard 5367 2022 in both sections 425 of the NTSI and 42825 or lock and pass TSI. In this updated reference to this standard in the TSI, in other words, we have made some flexibility in order to overpass uh, the, the limits for the current well, for trains equipped with electric energy storage for transition purposes and where they are charging the batteries. Of course, this permission uh, is, is uh, we, we studied uh, really careful how to allow this flexibility and to overseek the, to overpass these limits. And uh, um, we saw that this permission should be based in the fact that some infrastructure managers allows higher values of currents at the standard still than the ones in the standard uh, 5367 uh, in certain point of the infrastructure. Values which are uh, included and were declared in the register of infrastructures. So following the register of infrastructure, the battery trains and in these points and in these cases, the battery train can require a higher value of current, reducing the time of charging the battery and enable better performance and operation of these trains. Of course, this is still evolving. This is still evolving. Uh, and it is important to remark that we have to continue forward in the next uh, TSI revision to have interoperable rules and solutions for the network. This requirement, this requires additional information for the technical solutions at pantograph and contact line, but also for operation and signaling of such charging sections. No, no, it's, it's a good, <laughs> it's good, it's in this point. Um, Yes, um, and then a next slide. So in order to finish, before starting with uh, um, this next topic, that is um, the evolution protective provisions against electric shock, uh, we have seen that we have established certain uh, flexibility for the use of these pantographs for battery trains with charging the batteries. But of course, this is also applicable whenever the battery train could have another tool than a pantograph trying to get this, uh, uh, this current for the OCL. Of course, this is an open technology and uh, we are still studying and we envisage to include and to continue studying these, uh, these evolutions in the next TSI uh, revision. 
please. Okay. And so we are here in the evolution protective or the evolution of the protective provisions against electric shock. Um, we received some questions uh, after the last webinar uh, uh, focused in the way that we, we, which is the logical for which we have modified this uh, provision against electric uh, shock. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, the uh, protective provisions against electric shock is contained in the section 4 to uh, 18 of the TSI of the TSI energy. Um, this uh, section of the TSI requires compliance with the EN 5122, as last one. In previous TSI, the EN version was the two, uh, 2011, 2011. And now we have updated in the TSI revision the reference to the EN version 2022 with the current state of art. In this update, we have included the following clauses of the standard 2022. You can read it in the slide, please. Uh, previous, in the previous slide, no, previous one, please. The, pre the previous one, the previous one, this one. You can read in this slide that we uh, um, uh, we have selected these uh, um, clauses: five one, five two one, five two two, five three one, five three two, five three three, and five three four. Um, we need to explain that in the previous TSI with the references in the 2011 uh, version of the standard, these res clauses were, were already applicable only for public areas. So this was the focus in the previous TSI and in the previous version of the standard. And therefore, following this same reasoning, we have selected these clauses in the version 2022 for public areas. This was the logical behind. Of course, uh, we have seen uh, okay, that some clauses, the 6.1 and 6.2 of the uh, EM version 2011, uh, were really going to to too far because they are dealing with uh, protective or with protection against indirect contact uh, of exposed uh, conductive parts in all areas. So we have deleted these uh, sections of these clauses of the old standard, uh, but they are somehow still applicable because, and in the logical, in a logic way, because the clause 532 of the EM version 2022 is referring now, now to the clause 62 for conductive uh, parts. So in this way, we keep the link to the clause 62. I hope this answers uh, some questions uh, we received from some experts um, uh, in the sector about the logic behind this um, uh, this modification. Of course. In the next slide, um, as you see, uh, our main focus when doing this update was provide a clarification or, or to clarify the provisions to focus in public areas, of course, to update to the state of the art. And, but also, you know, the standard uh, EM5122 is a leaf standard. There will be evolutions and there are other parts than the part one, part two and part three. And also we envisage to come back on them uh, to um, uh, decide in the next TSI revision if uh, additional requirements are uh, necessary. Thank you. Another uh, another point that uh, for which is, uh, this is a very interesting uh, interesting point, the harmonic and dynamic effects. Another uh, uh, topic to, for which we have received uh, some questions, which is the evolution uh, above all because this is. Uh, the, the, the evaluation of the requirements uh, of these uh, topics is complex and normally, as I will explain uh, now, requires a compatibility a compatibility study. But in some questions, uh, uh, we receive not the proposal, but they ask us if we envisage alternative uh, methods to, to, to the compatibility study. Next slide, please. So, as you see, um, First, we have to see that uh, the sections, which are the sections of the TSI referring to the uh, harmonic and dynamic effects, are these two sections. You see the 428 in the TSI N and the 428 in the TSI lock and pass. They are interlinked and they define the, the requirements for both sides in the site of the energy subsystem and in the site of the uh, rolling, uh, uh, rolling stock site. Uh, in the previous TSIs, these sections were referring 
to classes of the standard 5388 version 2012, including the need to perform a compatibility study by the applicant for rolling stock authorization. In this uh, TSI revision, this EN has been replaced by the new version 2022. And in this new version 2022, the, 2022, the standard has been split into parts. The part one uh, being really the, the heritage of the old standard, uh, being the evolution of the previous standard, and which continues to contain the conditions for the compatibility study to be developed by the applicant of rolling stock authorization. And there is a new part two that is still under development with conditions for common code of practices, which is the alternative to the compatibility study. Next slide, please. Therefore, what we did, because the part two was not already available. So in this revision of the TSI, uh, we decided to update the reference to the EM 5388 to the part one. This already means an adaptation to the state of art in the subject and the facilitation of application of the TSI by the sector. And of course, the part two is not still available, but with this alignment, the TSI revision, it will be eventually possible for the next TSI revision to include the evolution for the series of the series of these standards 5388 uh, on common code of practices. And uh, once this alternative is ready in the standard, and we will study the possibility to include it in the next TSI uh, revision. OK, then uh, please, could you go before in the in the slides? to the multiple pantograph operation because I think we pass. Only a, and a small reminder because I, th I think this topic uh, we uh, uh, well, uh, we deal, we tackle uh, that is, uh, and we are a bit short of time. We tackle with this um, with this um, issue or with this topic in the previous uh, in the previous webinar, but also we received some questions. Um, OK, in this we have to we have to say that uh, the agency um, and the, the sector performed a discussion on harmonized requirements for the design uh, of the OCL and the pantograph dis uh, distribution in case of multiple pantograph operations. Uh, OK, we studied different, uh, different, uh, different points, but you see, the adjustment for the test was made in the sections of the NTSI and lock and pass uh, TSI. We detected some uh, points um, for further research because uh, we detected some parameters uh, which could have an influence in this um, multiple pantograph uh, operation, but only until uh, 160 kilometers per hour. The thing is that, um, on the question is that, we still need more research above these 160 kilometers per hour among other elements. Um, the, in order to get more information, you could go to the webinar in, in July, but we have to say that uh, the, main, uh, the main objective of this, uh, of this project in the case of the agency and the TSI is, uh, or it was, um, to obtain uh, the requirements, the requirements for an harmonized application of multiple, multiple operation. Which expectations we have on that uh, on that point? Yes, we have expectations to obtain an objective in this uh, in this point, but uh, I, I think it's too early to to provide answer to the to the questions uh, received. We need more research in that point, and we hope we hope we could have the possibility to continue with this project uh, in the next uh, TSI um, next TSI revision. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, the participants, and I think uh, I will give back the floor to Cyril. Thank you. Cyril. Thank you very much, uh, Esteban. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you, Gaetano. Thank you, Roberto. We are now going to jump to the questions that we received either on the uh, email uh, box or live during um, the first part of this uh, of this session the my first question will be for Gaetano Gaetano Imperato regarding the TSI energy point 731 of the annex what counts as major modification works is the criteria line speed increase sufficient please Gaetano
I think I will uh, I will I will give the floor to uh, if you want to, because it's, it's your TSI, so it's. Uh, then Esteban, please, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, so I was muted. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Karakelian, because I think we received this question in the previous webinar. So uh, if this was uh, we have it, uh, we have it in the in the um, in the pipeline, uh, which is a major modification. Well, uh, in the TSI, there are no definitions of a major modification. In the TSI, we focus on the four criteria to identify projects considered as upgrading. Uh, line increase uh, uh, speed uh, is a criteria for upgrading and we need to focus on that. We don't tackle with major modification provisions in the um, in the chapter seven of the TSI. Uh, I think uh, there was a, another question about uh, uh, if in that case an authorization for placing in service is necessary. I have to say that uh, uh, again in the TSI we don't have provisions for the authorization for placing into service. And in chapter seven, we don't have these such uh, provisions. This is tackled at a national uh, level. Um, then uh, the question about the, uh, the, um, the line speed, uh, more than 30 kilometers per hour. Um, OK, I think we received a question uh, if an existing uh, non easy declared line using the all national OCL system with no certified interoperability constituent could uh, could be uh, modified or could be upgraded uh, with an, a variation of a speed uh, of uh, more than 30 kilometers uh, per hour. Um, I have to say that yes, yes, but uh, uh, then it would be an upgrade. Why Why not? And with the fully application of the TSI, of course, for upgrading, uh, we have the fully application of the TSI. But And, and we need to uh, remember in this point for the interoperability constituents that the section 623 of the TSI uh, the exception for the certification of ICs uh, prior to the easy verification at subsystem level has been updated with uh, no deadline. So now it's uh, still possible to have a verification at a, or an easy verification at uh, easy level, at easy level, uh, uh, without having the IC, uh, the interoperability components uh, components uh, certified. Uh, also. Um, I received another question. I think uh, that this uh, is in uh, the new version of the TSI. The parameter, the maximum train current, is not mentioned anymore in section 4241. Then, is the easy verification and declaration no longer, no longer compulsory uh, if the maximum train current on a line is changed? Again, uh, Chapter 7 includes provisions for upgrading a mandatory full application of the TSI. It does not include provisions on easy declaration for verification. In this, pro in this point, the provisions of, of the interoperability directive and the Commission Implementation Regulation 2019-250 apply. Then uh, the technical question, uh, uh, I would say to the, to the participant and to Mr. Arakelian, uh, is the change of the maximum train current inscribed in an upgrading? If yes, the TSI is fully mandatory. And as explained in the new version of the TSI, the quality index is necessary as stated in this section 424 of the TSI and the reference to clause 8.2 of the standard 53813. Uh, 5388 is last one uh, in version 2022. 20, uh, I hope that I could answer this amount of questions because it was quite interesting, quite long regarding to the implementation of the TSI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esteban. Do, if you wish to keep the floor, there are other questions for you that arrived in the meantime. Uh, one on the pantographs. Would you, would you like to reply to that question now? It's maybe I can just read the question. How to consider other pantograph designs designed only for charging ESS, but with another shape than the one defined in EN 5367? Please, Esteban. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Uh, this is very interesting, and that's the reason we introduced the slides uh, on the um, on the. Uh, we need to remember the slides of the of the battery trains 
because this is applicable to this kind of uh, pantographs. But in order to 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 start from the sort of basic uh, principles, we need to remember pantographs. As they are defined, pantographs need to fulfill the TSI lock and packs uh, conditions. And especially the sections 428292 and 428293 for pantographs for head geometry. This means different clauses of the standard 53667. Uh, of course, this normal pantograph, but if I, as I understand the question, this pantograph will be used only to charge batteries. It will not be used in running mode. Then, if the pantograph is only intended to charge batteries at a stand still and not in running mode, uh, some requirements of the TSI are not applicable. Dynamic behavior and other requirements, but still the limits for the uh, current at the stand still, or the, for instance, the static contact force, contact force are still applicable. Um, of course, uh, this is really a new, a new technology. Um, uh, of course, we are following up the, the evolution of these technologies, battery trains, also hydrogen trains in the, um, in the agency. And for sure, in the next TSI revision, we will come back to that to uh, be, see the evolution of these mm, new technologies. If there is a pantograph or another tool to uh, to uh, obtain this uh, energy and the, uh, the the current to charge the, the the batteries, I have to say it and, and, and to finish. But that the, the applicant, because it depends also of in the in the approach of the applicant for the authorization. If the applicants consider that this pantograph is not really a pantograph in the classical way, but another kind of system, then maybe there are no specific requirements in the tie in the TSI for this uh, for this system. But it doesn't mean that there are no requirements. You know that the Novo normally is, well, the Novo is the uh, is the entity in principle uh, um, uh, uh, in charge to verify the compliance with the with the TSI requirements during the during the the authorization, but. For other systems, the applicant has the, the, the obligation to um, proceed with the requirements capture. The requirements capture includes all the requirements regarding safety and interoperability that could affect the systems, whether they are contained in the TSI or not. And the ASBO, the role of the ASBO is to verify this, um, that this requirements capture has been uh, properly verified. So this is also a global Another piece of information that could be interesting for the for the participant making the question. Thank you very much. I think I finished with this question. Thank you very much, Esteban. Thank you very much. I will now then go to Gaetano. Gaetano, uh, we received a question related to the applicability of the amended TSI infrastructure to the project in advanced stage of development. Um, so, well, Gaetano, what can you what can you say about that? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cyril. So, is uh, this allow me to go back to my first uh, introduction? So, was uh, we don't need the slide, but it's just a simple to 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 say. If at energy TSI we have an, with the last amendment, we have just improved the. Um, the understanding of a requirement. So uh, we consider there is no transition period and apply to the new project as uh, the upgrading project. I think uh, was uh, it's concise, but uh, it's also no doubt, no transition as uh, lock and pass TSI wagon so is to keep in mind. I give you the floor. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gaetano, but stay here because I have another question for you. The second question refers now to clause 732 of the Annex 2 uh, of the Commission Implementing Regulation uh, 23 and 1694. What is meant by application of this TSI shall be compulsory and apply to the upgraded subsystem within the geographical coverage of the upgrading? How is this geographical coverage defined based on locations, on tracks, and metric references? What exactly are the locations on tracks and what are metric references? Who determines them? It's a very precise question, Gaetano. Yes, I think it uh, will be useful to, to go to the slides. I don't know if you can display and uh, 
is just one of the first where we have this criteria. I also promised to answer this <laughs> with geographical coverage. Uh, yep, slides are coming in a few seconds. <laughs> Anyway, I can I can I can start to to send is slide is slide seven can be if you, when we display it. So, or the info is is, is the same. No, ah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I was <laughs> I had the previous. After the um, okay, we need to go down. Uh, OK, yes, 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 you start from here with OK, is the next one. Yes, it's 15, 15. Sorry. Yes, indeed, the, this is the concept of geographical coverage is something that we have introduced for upgrading, but is, is also valid for new subsystem. But uh, um, uh, we have introduced uh, um, this uh, because uh, need to be clear, uh, uh, what we are uh, upgrading, so and this need to be reflected also on the, in the certificate. So uh, mainly uh, we need identified uh, a linear point, so on the line, so where we start and when we end, and uh, simply um, is a choice of the applicant to define uh, where are these uh, starting and ending point. So we don't give uh, further details uh, of, uh, but the second one, so the location on tracks means uh, uh, a switch uh, could be a, a, the axis of a building in a station. So it's really plus the metric reference. So the kilometers every, so it depends really uh, by the network. So that uh, why is important to define this? Because as we said, in case uh, we are in a upgrading project, you need to apply all the requirements, so you cannot skip. So you cannot uh, imagine that in this section you have a, a bridge. You need to fulfill the requirement for the bridges. But in case of upgrading, in case of upgrading is a, a, are not the new requirement for bridge, but the specific requirement that we have for existing infrastructure. Um, I think there was also who determines them. I think I have answered it is uh, the applicant. So I hope I have answered uh, completely the question. Thank you very much, Gaetano. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Gaetano. Now I have a bunch of questions for you, Antoine. Um, the first one, so on the PRMTSI, can the station manager decide that a specific part of the subsystem that is upgraded or renewed will not be adapted to the requirements? For example, not provide a 160 centimeter width of the obstacle fee free route in the corridor leading to the toilets because it would require changes to the structure of the building. Antoine, please. Thank you, Cyriel. Uh, I will answer uh, twice uh, yes to your question. Uh, it's possible because first there is an exception uh, in the width for an existing building when this uh, adaptation of the width uh, would require structural alterations to the building. So the, the width of 160 centimeters is not mandatory. And a second time, yes, because as I said, the, the upgrades and renewal are targeting a gradual improvement of accessibility. So if it's been decided to, to, to improve the access uh, just by the addition of tactile working surface indicators, for example, uh, or by changing the, the floor coverage to make it anti-slippery together with tactile working surface indicator, then the TSI does not require to, at the same time, enlarge the corridor to 160 centimeters. So there are really two aspects. First is the exception, which is in the TSI, and the second is the fact that 
the, 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 the improvement is gradual, and if the width is not improved, by it may be at the uh, next stage, but it's not mandatory. Thank you very much. Stay close, please. Antoine, I have another question for you. Should gradual improvement of accessibility result from the National Implementation Plan of Regulation? Antoine. The, the gradual improvement of accessibility is really the, the principle for the improvements described and prioritized in the National Implementation Plan and also for the upgrade and renewal resulting from other um, from other sources than the National Implementation Plan. In any case, the, 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 the philosophy is to improve accessibility or to, to move to TSI compliance in a gradual way and to focus really on what is uh, directly benefiting to, to the um, to the users, to the passengers. And in that case, the example of the staircase, I think is a good example. A staircase of 140 centimeters, for example, is, is acceptable. What is more urgent is to ensure that there is the visibility of the steps, that there is a double on rail, that there is a tactile walking surface indicator to and from the staircase. The width, let's say, is, is probably less important. So let's put the money where it really benefits uh, the users. Indeed, thanks. Another question, um, should it be considered that the National Implementation Plan specifies the scope and schedule of required actions aimed at gradual improvement of accessibility, Antoine? And if I understand well the question, I would say yes. That's 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 the objective of the of the national implementation plan. It's really it was really because the national plans are, are required in the TSI since 2014. They were in general published in 2017-18, meaning that they will be revised in the near future. So the objective was really to put together all actors. Uh, of the of railway with the users uh, and with the ministries who generally finance uh, largely finance all these uh, all these works in order to 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 define a coordinated way and uh, to improve accessibility thank you very much antoine Another question for you, still on the on the PA, PRM TSI. What is meant by the characteristics of the inherited railway system, Antoine? Well, I think I, I mentioned it during the presentation, more or less. In fact, all the the complete railway system is, is uh, generally very old. The life uh, lifetime of a station is uh, several hundred years. Uh, the same for tunnels. We have many tunnels that are more than 100 years, and we are facing difficulties now when when wanting to operate uh, combined transport uh, containers or semi-trailers. It's the same for stations. Some stations are uh, are very very in a very constrained environment. I will take the example of Bruxelles uh, Central Station, for example. That probably uh, many of us know. Uh, in Brussels Central, there are many limitations to what can be done to improve accessibility because it's uh, in the middle of the city. The, the space available is not very uh, generous. And uh, the, voilà. so we inherit of all that. And that's the reason why we have to, we have to cope with it and to, to, to target on the improvement of accessibility really to fulfill the needs of the of the users rather than really target the, the full compliance to the TSI. Thank you very much, Antoine. Another question for you. Uh, the Article 10 requires the full compliance with the TSI for projects with received 
the union uh, financial support, the European financial support, does the principle of gradual improvement of accessibility indicated in point 722 apply also in those cases? One. Uh, again, the, the, the principle of gradual improvement is uh, exists in the TSI, so it's part of the TSI. I would say that the difference in case of uh, financing is probably that the scope of the application will be wider, uh, meaning that a full station will be covered, not just only part of the station or for part of the um, for part of for part of the of the parameters. Uh, well, in that case, maybe when there is funding, the, the full station need to be upgraded with all the parameters, but still with the, the exceptions remaining that are the three that I mentioned during the presentation. Thank you very much. We will now go, uh, we'll take a little break from uh, from the PRM TSI. We'll go to Esteban for a question on TSI energy. In the case of upgraded subsystem, according to 7.2 of the TSI energy, um, should all the aspects included in table B1 be verified or only those affected by the change? Please Esteban. Okay, uh, just thank you for this uh, for this for this question uh, because okay, then uh, we have to say that in case an upgrade on a, of an upgrading, uh, uh, the full TSI uh, application of the application of the full TSI is uh, mandatory. So, in this point, we would say that it's equivalent to a new to a new subsystem for which, also, accordingly to the chapter seven two of the TSI the uh, application of the full TSI is mandatory. So in this way, it should be treated in the same way for the uh, all the parameters of the of the table to, of the table to of in the annex B of the of the TSI. So the answer is uh, yes. In short terms, I think it's good. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Esteban. Back to you, Antoine. We have uh, see rather three questions now for you. The three last questions, I think. As far as we understand, the latest change uh, in the latest change, the validity, the, valid the validity, sorry, for luck and pass constituents is unlimited. Why is this not the case for the ICs of INF, PRM, and Energy TSI, Antoine? Uh, it's a it's a good question. <laughs> I think this is linked to the process of TSI revision rather than uh, any difference between the subsystems. Uh, when we carried out the revision between 2020 and 2023, we were specifically tasked by the Commission to review the transition regime of uh, TSI is applicable to rolling stock. And that was a uh, the subject of our first uh, Q&A session, where we presented in detail this uh, transition regime, which was focusing on the uh, CCS, TSI, rolling stock part, lock and pass, wagon, uh, and PRM also for the rolling stock part. And during the discussions, we elaborated a new transition regime in which the infrastructure, the interoperability component constituents, sorry, and the subsystems have uh, certificates of type certificates with no limit in the validity. And we didn't extend this application to um, to the, the constituent of, uh, of energy infrastructure and PRM fixed installation part. But we could. We could keep this for, for a next revision, probably, because uh, in, actually there is no, no reason why this constituent couldn't have uh, an indefinite validity of the type certificate, no, no reason. It's just the way the, the, the change has been processed that result in, the, in such a difference. Thank you very much, Antoine. Another question for you about the impact of amendments to TSI, INF, Energy and PRM on ongoing investments. 
in the light of issued certificates, which authorization for placing into services is not yet issued by NSAs. Is it necessary to incorporate changes into issued certificates, which come from changes to particular TSIs? Very practical question. No, as we said, for all three TSIs that we presented today, uh, structural TSI, let's say, because we had also the OPE TSI, for all three structural TSIs that we presented today, the application of the new uh, the new requirements of the new TSI is not mandatory when you have a, an ongoing project or a project at an advanced stage of development final tendering procedure, etc. So in all those cases, it's not mandatory to apply the new TSIs. And the certificates can be obtained with uh, according to the previous version, the version applicable uh, before the 20th of September, and the NSA will authorize the subsystem on, the, on that basis. Thank you very much, Antoine. And the very, very last question of this session is for you, and it's or for any one of the speakers here today, but yeah, no, it's for you. Uh, it's a very, very practical question. When uh, will appear the guide to the new TSI energy? Well, it would also be for you, but please take the floor. Well, the, thank you. The, the guides are, uh, are almost finalized, uh, not only for energy, but all the guides, the guide for lock and pass, PRM, noise, uh, infrastructure, energy. Uh, we have also updated the general part of the guide, which was really obsolete on our website. All this is almost ready. What we are waiting for now is uh, the consolidated text of the TSIs which is completely not in our control because it is being elaborated by the, the European Commission and not our counterpart in the European Commission, let's say, not, not by DigiMove, by the DG translation or by the translation services. So we have no idea when the, when the consolidated versions will be available. Once we receive the consolidated version, we have a final check to ensure that what we have in the guide, because in the guide we have a lot of, um, of extracts from the TSI, so we will ensure that what we have in the guide is, uh, is correct, and then we will publish the guide. Uh, I think if we receive the consolidated version before the end of November, the guides will be published before the end of the year. Thank you very much, Antoine. We are now reaching the end of this third Q&A session, and I would like really to thank you a lot for your questions, for your participation and your presence today. I would also like to thank warmly uh, my colleagues, Roberto, Gaetano, Esteban and Antoine uh, for their work and dedication in preparing for this event. In the backstage, I would like to thank Dorothea Sparpen, whom I thank also for her presence in this very spot during the previous session. Said Rajput and Juan Arcanco for their support. I also wish a good recovery to our colleague Pedro Mestre, who couldn't be with us today as originally planned. Dear attendees, we really hope that you enjoyed this Q&A session and that it fulfilled your expectations. You can send your feedback on this session via the QR code you're seeing right now on the screen. We look forward to meeting you again at one of our upcoming events. So first, let me remind you of the date of the last upcoming Q&A sessions dedicated to TSIs. You are more than welcome to send your questions to the email address displayed on the screen. An important information, this functional mailbox will be blocked, will be deactivated on the 30th of November, end of business. Uh, after that day, if you wish to ask any question on the TSI uh, and after the last Q&A session, you are kindly invited to go through the usual process using the contact us section of the website. Then please note that the agency is organizing a training, an investigating SMS training uh, on the 5th uh, to the 7th of December. On the 6th of December, there will be a press briefing 
organized uh, at the Brussels Press Club, marking the official launch of the Railway Fact Sheets, a compelling content that has been developed by the agency. The briefing will also cover the definition and future linkage of railway data. This event requires prior registration. All the details are available on the ERA website. A few days later, the, in the ERA's headquarters in Valenciennes, the agency is organizing a safety leadership training. There are still a few seats available. You can also register. All the information are on our website. And last but not least, if you still don't know, the agency is pleased to announce that the 2024 edition of the ERTMS conference will take place from the 23rd to the 25th of April um, 2024. You can save the date. Having said that, if you would like to stay updated on our activities, you can always check our website and sign into our database by selecting the button Login on our website page. And you can, of course, follow us whenever you want on our very active social media accounts, X and LinkedIn. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you, uh, on behalf of all my colleagues today, present a very good afternoon. We hope to see you on the 7th of December. Thank you very much. Bye.